Hello. I am glad you joined us for this episode of Pushing Boundaries. I have a very special guest who had a very near-death encounter with Jesus. His story is incredible. He's not only the author of An Encounter with a Healer, which is his testimonial book. Him and his brother, Bo, also wrote True Riches, which is another fantastic, really showing the love of God, showing the love of Christ. Ken has so much to share, but we're going to talk about his testimony today and let it just fill you up with true hope, with expectation that what the Father did for Ken, he would do to you. Yes. Amen. And so without any further ado, Ken, welcome to Pushing Boundaries. Hey, praise God, Tony. It's a pleasure to be on your show, brother. Uh, look forward to uh, speaking and sharing and, uh, you know, just seeing what God's going to do today. So first of all, this happened relatively recently. This is not something that happened five years ago or 10 years ago. This, no. this actually happened, well, this experience didn't happen on Christmas Eve. You were sick Christmas Eve. Right, yeah. Of, of 21. Sure, to, uh, to give the listeners a time frame. So, yeah, I was out at the family ranch. You know, I'm out there, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God. I just love to be out in nature and God's creation. So I'm out on 181 acres and you know, there's always something to do out there. I've got 300 bags of concrete. I'm tossing around, uh, you know, 60-pound bags of concrete like they're pieces of paper, fixing the roads where it's kind of washed out. We had a little washout, some heavy storms in East Texas. And so, yeah, it started then. I got up uh, on Christmas Eve. We've always had a tradition. We go over to my brother's house and have a big feast, and the Chin family goes there. And, uh, yeah, as soon as I got up from dinner, man, I knew, uh, you know, something was, wasn't right. I started having cold sweats and chills and, uh, you know, I toughed it out, made it through the night. As soon as I got home, my wife and my father-in-law and my daughter were with me. I went straight to bed and I thought, you know, uh, I, I'll get through this. My wife went to the drugstore. You know, COVID was running rampant and she got a COVID test. I tested negative, so she felt better. And <clears throat> we thought, you know, some kind of virus is going around. Now, now, I've got to ask here. Yeah, uh, did you did you have any concerns that it may have been COVID, or did you? Oh yeah, yeah, I did because it was just rampant in in East Texas at this time. I mean, the hospitals are loaded up. I had colleagues that I work with. Uh, one of them had died from COVID. Um, okay. You know, friends, you know, died. It was, uh, you know, I know other spots in the world got hit, but it was pretty tough here in East Texas and. Uh, so we definitely had concerns. That's why she went and did that um, to, you know, I'm not sure how accurate any of these tests are, but that's right. another <laughs> story. But but uh, anyway, I, I just thought, you know, I'm a tough guy. Uh, you know, I'll double up on my vitamins, drink plenty of fluids and rest. And But the next day was Christmas Day. And on Christmas Day, we have everybody come over to our house. Um, I stayed in bed all day. I didn't go anywhere. I could hear all of the fun going on. But uh, Ken Chin was nowhere to be found in the mix of that. And I'm stubborn. You know, I probably should have gone the next day, but it was actually December 28th uh, when I went to the ER clinic, the local ER clinic. And as soon as I walked in, man, they, they said, you know, diagnosed me, tested me, said, you've got uh, COVID-19, the Delta variant. They gave me some medications and, you know, they sent me home. Said, you know, if you don't feel better in two days, come back. Well, guess what? <laughs> I was back in two days. Um, I was feeling weaker. You know, my breathing was more labored. And, I, you know, I knew things at this point were getting worse. So they gave me some stronger medication and they sent me home again. And then uh, two days later, I'm back again, Tony. This time they hooked me up to oxygen. They x-rayed my, my lungs and I've, I've got COVID-19 pneumonia. My lungs mm -hmm. are starting to scar up and, uh, you know, there was some concern there. And so they, they actually sent me home the third time. So they sent you home three times? Three times. Wow. Uh, now, during this time, is your state of mind still positive or were you getting to where it's like, oh, my gosh, 
something's going on bad here. Did you realize how how bad it was getting? I did. I, something's going on bad. And so I went back a fourth time and thank God, you know, uh, man, the doctor that treated me this time, he just didn't give me something. And because they were overrun. I mean, man, uh, everybody was in there. And he said, the only way you're leaving here is by an ambulance. I mean, he put his foot down. Uh, he saw in me what he had experienced a year earlier. And he said, I'm, I'm personally going to see to it. I'm going to get you a room at the local hospital. Just hang with me. You know, I'll come back and check on you. I got other patients to deal with. But had he had he or another doctor sent me home, I, I really think I would have died. But he he saw in me, uh, he really intervened. I think God used him to, you know, he knew the seriousness of it because of his own personal experience. You know, he came back and would share with me about every hour. You know, a little five, a little minute, little tidbit, and he had to go see another patient. But he was very encouraging, and uh, you know, very tried to be positive about the whole thing. Even though there, at this point, there wasn't much to be positive about. So, I've got to ask this: Was he a Christian? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, he really had a caring and concerned heart. I went back to see him when I got better. I thanked him and and. He didn't remember how I was until I started telling him about 10 minutes of the story. And he said, oh, my gosh, that's right. Ken. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I got it. I got it, man. Because that's so unusual for a doctor to check in on a patient every hour. That is like, wow, that, that fella had a loving heart. He really so, did. Uh, okay, you know, so then... Go ahead. Go ahead with your story. <laughs> I don't want to give anything away. Go ahead. So, yeah. So I'm hanging out there for I don't know, about seven, eight hours. And, you know, sad to say, Tony, but, you know, someone had to die for me to get a room and a room opened up. So they transport me by ambulance to the local hospital. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, rest and get a little relaxation and get everybody out of my business, you know. Well, those first it I just wasn't how it went down. You know, I had doctors and internists uh, and they were just forcing me to go on a vent. They were in my face. and uh, Okay, so know, why didn't you go on a vent? Well, you know, I told them, you know, everything that I'd read and studied, uh, I told them everything that I'd read about a vent, only 12% of the people that go on those vents live to come off of it. And I just said, you know, if, if what you say is true, if I'm going to die, I want to die with the awareness that I have. I, I'm going to go out and, you know, you're not, not going to just knock me out and stick me on a vent. Uh, if this is how it's going to end for me, you know, I'm not going to go that way. And I, I made a decision. I'm not giving medical advice for anybody else. Uh, you know, they can, everybody has to make their own decisions. I really had a conviction. You know, they were telling me, Tony, they were saying, well, you know, you don't know how sick you are. We're here. We're trying to help you. You're not letting us help you. Let us help you. Uh, you're not in your right frame of mind. You're so sick. But when I gave him that number, 12%, it was um, mildly combative, we'll say, a conversation going back and forth with a discussion about whether I was going to go on a vent or not. But when not one of them said, oh, you know, you're wrong, Ken, it's 35% or it's 50 or it's 40, it's a whole lot more than 12. When not one of them said that, it kind of, you know, it. I thought, well, you know, I'm making the right choice for me. Now, just... That just reaffirmed that you were hearing from the Holy Spirit. Don't yep. go on the bed. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I was in deep prayer at this time because, you know, I, at this point, I can't stand up. And, uh, I mean, they, I'm in a wheelchair. I'm on oxygen. I'm fading quick. I really was. I think my oxygen level was in the low 80s right here. You know, normal for your listeners, 98. So, um, right. N anything not a, not anything le uh, less than mid 80s, less than 85, yeah, is actually very bad. Anything Dang less no. than 85, yes. um, they not actually, good. according to the doctors, there can be some uh, long term bad effects for spending any amount of time less than 85. Correct, you're already praying to God, He's already in your thoughts. Are you in a room at this point, or are you still out in the hallway? Didn't you spend you spent quite quite a while in the hallway, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm. They have rolled me down <laughs> into a, a room where these docs and internists are at at this point in time. And so, as I, you know, made my choice, one by one, they left, and they said, you know, your decision's on you, mm -hmm. and you know, you're taking responsibility. 
it's not on us. You know, if you if you die, it's just, you know, it's kind of what they're saying. You know, you're making a choice for death. And I felt like they were t- just almost dismissing me. So one by one, they all left uh, to go treat their other patients who would comply with whatever they were dishing out. And shortly after that, I found myself uh, in a hospital bed being rolled down the hall to the end of the hall uh, by a nurse uh, pushed into a room. And uh, instead, since I wouldn't go on that, they put me on a BiPAP breathing machine, this face mask that forces air into your lungs. And, um, you know, they sent my wife home. Uh, my brother had come up because uh, one of the docs that knew him called him and, you know, said, hey, you know, if you want to see Ken again, you might want to come on up right now. Uh, and so I'm all alone, man. I'm all alone. I'm in a room all by myself, this BiPAP mask on. And, and it's it's serious. Uh, I realized the labor and the struggle that I was up against. And, you know, my thought was, my God, you know, how did I get here so quick? You know, a week or so ago, I'm tossing around 60 pound bags of concrete. Now I can't stand up. I can't breathe. I've got this face mask strapped up face and um, I'm all alone in a room all by myself. And I went from dealing with the doctors to dealing with God. I shut everything off. God, I just began to pour out my heart to cry out to God. And, um, you know, the first passage that came to my mind was Genesis chapter 32. I'm sure all your listeners know it is when Jacob wrestled with the angel. You know, he didn't say a five minute prayer and, you know, that's it. He wrestled all night long. I mean, he thought his his life was over. He thought the life of his family was over. I mean, Esau's a bad dude. He's going to take them all out the next day. You know, I mean, this is how it was going to go down. He prevailed. He wrestled. He struggled with God and said, I, you know, I will not let you go unless you bless me. All these scriptures that I've known for, you know, 40, 50 years just that were very intense and had to do with life and death and desperation just began to spring up out of my spirit and come up into my mind. And thank God, I don't think I know I wouldn't have made it if I didn't know the Bible. You know, I began to cry out, you know, God, God, you know, you're 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 my ever present help. You're my ever present help, God. I need your help now, God, in my time of need. God, I need you now. Not tomorrow, God. I need you now. I need you, God, just to breathe, just struggling to stay alive and um, just crying out, you know, Psalm 73, 25 and 26. You know, my flesh, my heart are failing. God, you know, my body's shutting down. God, I, I need you, God. Be the strength of my heart. Strengthen me, oh, Lord. Just those desperate life and death situations. You know, I thought about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting thrown in the fire. And I felt like I was in the fire right now. I was in the fire of death. And I was like, God, you know, send your angel, rescue me out of this. Just praying for divine intervention. And now this, this you were doing, not for two or three minutes, like you said, this you were doing for hours, correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is Pretty much the whole night, as as you're going along, yeah. you you are in this state of prayer. I, I, they rolled me in that room probably around ten thirty at night, and I I knew I knew I was going to die if I went to sleep. And as weakened state as I was, you know, something rose up in me, and my prayer was not really for me. My prayer was, God, let me live. Let me live, God, so I can see my daughter get more established in the faith. God, let me live so that I can see her become more independent and more grounded. You know, God, have mercy upon me. God, let me be here to lead and guide and help her. And just as a father crying out for his only child, I was fighting. I was struggling, you know, to to stay, stay alive, to keep breathing. Just, you know, as we're talking, we don't think about it, but it just... You know, breath, I was praying, God, just like you breathed into Adam. God, breathe into me the breath of life. Lord God, just, God, help me. And travailing, you know, um, on and on, you know, I thought about Hannah, you know, the dumb priest Eli who was spiritually blind. You know, he thought she was drunk in the morning, but she was just crying out, emotion pouring her hat out, heart out to God, to for God to intervene in her circumstance. Just another desperate, passionate prayer. And the will to live rose up in you. Yeah, amen. Yes. And that is one thing I always try to impress on people. If you look, and especially in the King James Version, when somebody dies, 
they gave up the ghost. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. They Good gave point. up. And yeah. so one, one key is not to give up on your struggle. Just like with Ken, and this night was the same thing with me when I was going through the Lou Gehrig's disease. If, if I had completely given up, if they had put me on, um, what do you call that? Hospice. If they had put me in hospice, that would have been it for me. Oh, yeah. And in my case, my um, physical therapist that would come to the house, he was the one that, I mean, I, I didn't care. I mean, in my mind, I was a dead man. In his mind, he was doing everything he could do so that they would not put me in hospice. He mm. knew if I went on hospice, I would, I would die. And yeah. so, and I say that to really impress on two people that you don't give up. You let that righteous anger rise up in you and stay fighting to live. Go ahead, Ken. No, that's a great point. You know, it talks about in Jude to earnestly contend for the faith, you know, and, it, and Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. You know, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will rise up against him. And there has to be that fight. I think you're you really got a great point there, Tony. I mean, you just can't roll over and give up. I, it and, been and actually to receive your healing. The Greek yeah. word for receive means to seize, to yeah. take a hold of. You wrap your arms around it and you don't let it go, just as Ken's been talking about. And so I really did want to impress that point. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm just, yeah, I mean, this is going on all night long from, you know, 1030 till the morning. I knew I had to make it to the morning and just as the spirit of God just laid all these scriptures on me. You know, I, I thought about, you know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane passion, uh, the anguish, the travail of his soul. He's fixing to go to the cross and bear the sin of the world. And, you know, the, there's a medical term, and you know, it says that he, blood began to pour from his pores. It's the, I think I'm pronouncing it right, hematidosis, I think it's called. <laughs> but, you know, just that passion and just that that groaning and, and trying to break through. And, you know, I, one of the old revivalists that, I, that I've studied under and been around, uh, he used to say in his English accent, God does not answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. And brother, that's where I was. I was desperate. Uh, I had no hope. I felt like the doctors had given up on me. I had made this decision not to go on the vent. I knew that my life was in the hands of the Lord. You know, there's a brokenness and there's a, a a travail. There's that willingness to fight. Uh, all these things are in play. And as I began to think about all these things, you know, I, I started drilling down in Romans eight eleven. It says, if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. And as I just began to meditate upon that verse and just let it, you know, roll it over in my mind and just hang out there and just you know, I'm just almost just so weak. I'm just saying, God, you know, God, God, let your spirit, God, let your Holy Spirit just quicken me, God, let your spirit. And, you know, after about just a period of time of just hanging on that scripture, man, Tony, I just felt like just pow, just I had just a surge of of energy that flowed through my body. It just, you know, I felt like electricity. And I knew, you know, I knew. It was now, just, I want you to. I want you to get to the next point, but I did want to go back just a touch. Yeah. And make a statement about the desperate, travailing, all of that. What that is, is realizing we can't do it alone. And it's, it's as you said, brokenness in that, because the biggest thing interferes with a healing is the fact we still think that we can do it. Yeah. There's amen. this self-effort. Yeah. We think it's us. We th Instead, when you're at that desperation, now you are done with yourself. Now you're reaching for the Father. You're reaching for the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 is one of my favorite all-time verses. The Holy Spirit is giving life to my body. Yes, and amen. That's what the desperation does. You're not desperate in a sense that you don't know what God's answer is. No, 
You're desperate because you know he is the answer and we aren't. And so I just always want to make that clear. And now you have the lightning, the sensation flowing through your body. Pick it up from there, Ken, because things yeah. are getting real interesting now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, from just going from being just completely wiped out, you know, it, I just had this electricity running through my body probably for, you know, 30 minutes. And it was just such an encouragement. And, you know, I just uh, began to just keep praying. It, it allowed me to have strength. I, it was the first sign I thought that, you know, God is with me. You know, God has manifested himself to me, you know, hanging on to this scripture here. You know, I, my mind had been going all over throughout the Bible and, and pulling passages up. And I, I felt like they were just flowing out of me like a river, all these different scriptures. You know, that that was just so powerful and so encouraging. But, you know, after a period of time, I felt that I felt like it, you know, I just got unplugged and I, I began to feel weak again and desperate again. And, you know, I was just trying just to hang in there and um, to continue to pray and, you know, to, to cry out, you know, it says, God, you know, God, you're, you know, you're the God of my salvation. You know, in my time of distress, I'm calling upon you to deliver me. God, I'm in distress right now. I need deliverance. I need your touch. And just pouring these things out. Uh, and um, this went on for a period of time. And then my mind, I, I got glued into Romans uh, 8.26. You know, it talks about just groaning. And I, I'm so weak now. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm give out. And it talks about groaning that, you know, the spirit just you don't even have words sometimes, and 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 it's just getting so intense. I mean, I'm just I'm going oh oh oh, oh. and I, I mean I'm just I'm just groaning, Tony. I, I can't even say just oh, oh 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 just I can just say God, 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 oh, and just this rising up out of my belly, just, you know, at times it was just so intense. I, I say, you know, I, I felt like I was just going to burst. You know, I just had so much pressure within my body. Uh, and I'm just groaning in the spirit. I'm crying out, God, oh, oh, oh. You know, this went on for a period of time and I opened up my eyes as I looked down at my body and my arms. You know, it's surrounded. I'm covered in this white, glowing light. It was another second sign that God gave me, just a supernatural manifestation. And it, it wasn't like a light like we think about, like, you know, you turn it's a static light. This light was, it was covering my body. It was frosted and it was, it was like it was, it was moving and it was like particles of light moving and interacting rolling over my body and my arms and you know I, I hate to say my first impression was I, I thought I was going to die Tony I've read all these stories and heard these stories about you know men and women of God and um, you know they see the light and I'm thinking this is it Jesus you know they these saints you know they got people surrounding them or and they say oh man don't you see it I see heaven I see the angels I see Jesus and when, when, I was reading, when I was reading that part of your book, that was my first thought. When you were talking about the light, I was like, his, his spirit's separating from his body now. And then I read on, this was a very interactive, and would you say it would be what you would imagine pure white? Or yes. Pure, was, pure holiness, perhaps, would be a better way to explain it? Yes, it was just a very, as I got over that initial fear, I became fascinated by it. And I just began to look at my arms and my body, and I just couldn't keep my eyes off of it, just watching it rotate and move. And, and I, I became overwhelmed with the peace and the love and the energy of God. And I knew that this was just another supernatural sign that God was giving me, that, that God had not forsaken me, that God was with me. We all quote, you know, First John 4, 8, you know, that God is love. But, you know, true. I mean, God so loved the world and God is love. Back up a little bit to First John 1, 5, it says God, God is light. Mm -hmm. Light is a part of the very essence of God's being. And so this manifestation of light really became a, a comfort and a, a supernatural. It, it, you know, that surge of electricity was one thing, but seeing this light, brother, that lit me up for a while. You know, that, that, uh, so you had the electricity first. Yes. Then you, then you had, with the electricity, you had the energy. 
the energy, the electricity, and then this white light was happening and the peace. Now, would you say it was the peace that comes without understanding? (laughs) A peace that you can't even understand. I felt that peace when I was ill. Uh, Would you call it that peace? That would be beyond words? Yeah, this was uh, beyond human peace. It was just, uh, it was like things had just settled in my spirit, even though I was weak and still, you know, in this state fighting for my life. During the time that I was experiencing this light and seeing the light, it gave me comfort. It gave me strength. I felt love. I felt peace. Uh, You know, the Bible talks about the peace that passes understanding, which you're referring to. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was just so beautiful. I mean, I, I will see this light till I pass on and go be with the Lord one day or, you know, it sounds terrible, but, you know, I wouldn't trade as, as close as I was to death and one breath away all night long. I wouldn't trade this experience for anything. I think there's something to be said, you know, when you're when when it's death, when it's life, when it's eternity and it's just, you know, one breath away and you're conscious of that all night long, There, you enter into this spiritual realm. There's a scripture that says, you'll find me when you seek for me with all your heart. And, you know, that's on us. You know, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. And, you know, I can say this is one of the times in my life that I was seeking God with all my heart. Everything I had in my being, every cell in my body is crying out to God. You know, God, let me hang on. Let me hang on for my daughter. And, you know, I mean, I'm just there's no backup. There's no backup. You know, most of us got a backup plan or, you know, we, we've got something else we can do. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to make myself out to be something special. I mean, when Jesus said to the disciples, hey, you know, guys, can't you just hang out with me for an hour? You know, that's me, Tony. You know, my mind wanders all over the place. and But when you have that laser focus, laser focus, when you know, I have got, like the lady that touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she had to push through. Yes. She couldn't just stand back there in the back of the crowd. She had to make an effort. She had to push through. She had to fight where she could touch, touch and get that healing virtue coming out of Christ. And we play a part in that, you know. You know, are we seeking God with all our heart? You know, that's probably not popular with Christianity today, you know, uh, but that's just the Bible. I'm sorry, you know, that you can't start around that. Seek and ye shall find. Yes, amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Then all amen. these things shall be added unto you. And not only that, but that word seek isn't necessarily a negative context because of this. Uh, the more you seek, the truer version that you're going to get. Because And the deeper you're going to go, it's like you can swim in the shallow end yeah. And be content with that. Yes. Or you could go on the deep end and find more. The seeking and God is so infinite that there is so much to seek. It's a never ending journey. Really? You're seeing this light. How long does that last? Probably 30 minutes or so. And then are we getting about morning time now? Yeah. So this is probably going around, you know, 3.30 or so. Uh is happening. Because your biggest thought at the beginning, and I think throughout from what from reading your book, is if you could just make it to the morning. Amen. I knew. I knew because I had to focus. I had to be conscious. My every breath, it was a labor. It was a struggle. You know, it wasn't just, I'm just breathing. No. Right. And if I would have rolled over, and it was, I mean, I, I had a couple of times I thought, man, just give it up, you know, give up the ghost, as you say, give up the spirit. But I just, when those thoughts entered, I just said, no, you know, I'm going to fight this. And, uh, you know, something just kept rising up within me to, to continue to fight. Yeah. So this is going on about this time. And after about 30 minutes of this, the light just disappears. And when it does, just, you know, here I am, you know, I'm having these up and down experiences, you know, and I began to feel weak again and, you know, went into travail again and just crying out to God. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm I'm just trying to hang on and hang on and just every, every thing in me, you know, and I could feel my spirit just trying to leave my body at times. It was like, I was so sensitive at this point in time that you're almost in a different dimension and you have this heightened awareness and, you know, the flesh and the spirit and, you know, I, I say this, I, 
that I felt like there was a spirit of death in that hospital. You know, people were dropping from COVID and, and, you know, I, I believe it. I was, I could almost feel a tangibleness of the whole of the thing and that might spook people out, but I think it to be real, you know? Um, uh, yeah. So I'm hanging on, hanging on and, uh, just trying to, just trying to make it. And a period of time goes by. I'm still in prayer, man. I'm just, you know, Jesus, just, just in my weakened state, just trying to breathe, trying to pray. And, you know, I heard a door, I heard that rattling on that door, a glass door. And man, you talk about joy to my ears and exuberance to my spirit. As soon as that nurse slid that door open, (laughs) (laughs) and rip that curtain back. I felt like I was on a rocket ship. I just had this surge of the Holy Spirit. It was like the Holy Spirit just just came upon my body in just in a supernatural way. And I just felt just such a smile come over my face, you know, and I had such joy and I felt like I had just defeated death. You know, I felt like I had just won the victory and my mind is flooded with scriptures again, you know, about deliverance uh, and deliverance from death and imminent death. And I thought about the children of Israel of all things and how they had the mountains on both sides, the water in front of them, and the Egyptian army's coming to wipe them out. And it does not, you know, it's an imminent death to them. And, you know, God parted the waters. They walked over on dry ground. The Egyptian army drowned in the sea. And to me, you know, in my spirit, in my mind, it's like God was saying, you know, you've crossed over. You've gone into this different dimension and this opening up of something brand new for the nation and for and for you, uh, you know, I felt like something has just been ripped apart. That uh, you know, that there was this uh, new beginning or or new life and a new energy and a, a new perspective uh, that God had given me. God had answered my prayers. God had spared my life. God had miraculously spared my life. You know, I, I thought about the Psalms again. You know, back then uh, they were all hunters and tell, you know they just didn't go down to the store and pick up some meat. You know, David said, our soul, and this just rang through my spirit and my mind, our soul has escaped the death trap, just like the bird or the animal had escaped the trap. And I felt just like this release and this joy flooded over my spirit. Uh, I mean, it was just like the joy unspeakable and full of glory was what was going on inside me. You know, I began to think about Lazarus and <laughs> you know, I don't want to throw people off, but you know, I, you say, I, you know, you didn't die, Ken. I, I know I didn't die, but I felt like I came as close to death as you possibly could. You know, I felt at times, like I said, my spirit was, I felt like I just had to just pull and. In the book, Ken has pictures of him. And you <laughs> can <not> let <laughs> Was that? <laughs> I said, they're not very pretty. I, I look pretty rough. Exactly right. You can tell that Ken was close, was close. And that's what was real evident. I mean, I'm so, I'm grateful you could include those pictures because yeah. that really does show how yeah. close and that what you're saying is absolutely true. Because you can see it. I'm personally thankful you included the pictures. And, and there's quite a few of them. For the listeners, get the book. Um, <laughs> and re- read this this experience. So this is morning time and joy comes in the morning. Yeah. And so you are, you you feel like you've made it through, right? Right, yes, yeah. And yeah, now, like- um, and what, I want to kind of start wrapping it up a little bit. Sure. Now you did you did have my well, some would say a slower recovery. You went through stages, you developed strength and everything else. About right. thirty days, right? Roughly. Right. Okay. Right. Now let me ask you this. What things have you learned from having gone through that? Have there been some truly life changing moments? Is there a difference in the way you view life now? And the way you did prior to this experience. Absolutely. You know, I, I really, um, t- just every breath you take, Tony, and, you know, I, I was so weak, I couldn't even feed myself for three weeks. I mean, just the simple act of putting some food in your mouth, you know, uh, brushing your hair, brushing your teeth, uh, my weakened state, and just the preciousness of life and having a second chance that God answered my prayer and 
but it's it's opened up a different realm in the spirit as well. I mean, you know, have I spent another night in prayer all night since that night? I have not. You know, I haven't. But it it was a taste. It was a taste of the cost of really drawing close to God. Do I really want to enter into the Holy of Holies and, you know, be still and know that he's a God? And we're so rushed in the world. You know, Daniel says, many will run to and fro, but the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You know, I want to be one of those people for the re- whatever days God has left for me. You know, I want to do exploits for God, and uh, I know you do too, and you're doing them. Yeah, I mean, just the preciousness uh, of, uh, of being here. And, you know, we, we think, I mean, you know, I'm a tough guy. You know, we think I'm toss it around 60 pound bags of concrete and the next day, the next thing you know you know i can't even pick up a fork now i'm also saying that your gratitude levels are probably through the roof compared to how you were before would that be a true no, statement it would be 100 percent true you know the things that i can see other people get upset about such petty things <laughs> and i i really you know, I just look in amazement, Tony, not to be condescending or in a church, right. but I just sit back like, you know, I was at a restaurant the other day and I say these people get bent out of shape because, you know, their food was taking an extra five minutes to get cooked. And it was it was ruining their it's ruining their their whole time together. I can't believe I you know, can't get my food out here or, you know, lost my Internet connection. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, those things are such minor issues. Wow. Just love on your family, your loved ones, uh, your friends, uh, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And, you know, whatever you're going to do, do it. Do it. Uh, Don't put it off. Don't be a procrastinator. I mean, you know, if something's on your heart to do for the Lord, the unction of God's on you, the anointing's on you, don't waste time. If people don't see the vision, you're the only one that's got the vision, you do it. Amen. You know, run with it yourself until other people catch up with you. But yeah, do what God's called you to do and um, live out your destiny in Christ. Now, not only you've got this wonderful testimony, but you've, and I'm sure you've got even more than the two I'm going to talk about. Ken's mother had a miraculous experience and his daughter as well. So if you would just briefly... Just in a few minutes, tell us about your mother's miracle. In fact, you weren't, you, according to doctors, you wouldn't even be born, that's, nor your brothers. Yeah, that's oh. right. <laughs> yeah. So, mother, as a teenager, was leaving uh, the church. Uh, her and some friends were leaving the church at, on a Sunday night after service, and a drunk driver hit them. There's photographs in the book, and there's an article in the newspaper. You know, mother was right at the point of death herself. As a teenager, you know, she had a lot of spunk and a lot of fight. And she just, as she said, she just, I just refused. You know, I refused to to believe what the doctors were telling me. You know, back then, I mean, doctors were really on a pedestal. You know, you really, if the doctor told you something back in that generation, you know, that was almost second to the gospel. Now we kind of question a lot of the stuff they do because some things that are involved. So she just always was a fighter. And, you know, they said, number one, she had all these bones broken in her body. You'll never walk again. You'll live the rest of your life, you know, in a wheelchair. She just said, I had faith. Uh, Faith (laughs) rose up. And and this was when, you know, church people back then really prayed. They, uh, her church, they formed a 24-hour prayer group. And they did this before the internet and all that stuff. People were driving to the church, and praying all night long. You know, they were touching the throne of God. These were people that were doers of the word and not hearers only. So she had some faithful, godly uh, church members who knew what had happened. You know, she left church. So then she begins to recover and starts walking. And they said, well, you know, we hate to tell you, but you're never going to have any kiss. <laughs> we get a good laugh out of that one, Tony. Yeah. You, know, you'll, you will never have children. You, you can't. You'll never be able to conceive and 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 uh, give birth. And again, against the medical, you know, knowledge and so forth, she just said, "I, I refuse to believe that." I, you know, and uh, the joke with her was, she said, "I wanted to have a dozen kids. She had four, but yeah, she lived a long life, a fruitful life for the Lord." 
from that. And, you know, what what Satan meant for evil, God turned it out for good. And it was such a miracle. I mean, people in the community knew. Like I said, it's it was recorded by doctors, newspaper, and you know all that. It was this was wide in wide out in the open, as you'd say. Uh, nothing done in secret here. And so, yeah. I want to point out, and when I say this, I I am saying that there is a line, but you don't accept what the doctors tell you. If Ken would have accepted what the doctors told him, he more than likely wouldn't, wouldn't be here with us today. And the same with his mother. If his mother had accepted that, he wouldn't be here today <laughs> either. No. And once again, I am not telling you to not listen to their advice. Sure. And if they if they advise you and you're comfortable with whatever they're suggesting, by all means, do it. Yeah, amen. At the same time, you don't have to believe what they're saying the end result will be. Yes, I agree. Because, no. you know, that is so huge is what are we expecting to happen? Because the Lord gives us the desire of our heart. And in fact, you have hope deferred makes the heart sick. Desire yeah. comes. It is the tree of life. Yes. Amen. So you desire to be completely healthy and the Lord will grant that. Off my soapbox now. Uh, <laughs> Mama would have loved that, Tony. That's, that's her kind of preaching. Uh, faith. You know, faith is a mustard seed. You know, believe. Believe and you'll receive. You know, I heard that as a kid growing up, you know. You know, exactly God, right. God, and she lived it out. She did. God is a God of the impossible. Judges chapter 6, verse 13. It's a scripture that most people don't know, but it says, if God be with us, and we all say, you know, God's with us. God's, you know, God's in this. And if God be with us, where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of? So really in the Hebrew mindset, you could not separate God from the supernatural. Right. If, if God be with us. If he's really with us, just like with your healing and my healing and my mother's healing and my daughter's healing, if God is with us, somewhere in our chronological time frame, Tony, we should be able to look back and say, God performed a miracle here and here and here. And God is there. And if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would have perished. So, you know, it's just like when Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. He said, no man can do these miracles. You do, except, and it's those same four words, God be with you. Mm -hmm. And so if God be with us, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, We can think that there's this cessationist, as they call it, theology, that somehow or another, whatever God did in the past, he's not going to do today for you and me. I I don't believe that, not for a minute. Right. I can't find that in Scripture. And uh, I'm a student of the word and uh, there's you you just it's nowhere, you know, what God did then he can do now. Uh, we just need to believe and have faith and press in and. and right. Fight. And he wants to. Yes. He, he wants to. But we have to cooperate with him. Yes, we do. Amen. Only believe there is a cooperation factor if there, if someone doesn't get healed. We can't just blame God, and that is people's first thing. Well, God didn't want that person healed. Well, yes, he did. The problem is that person, do we want to be healed? Who are we looking for? Are we looking to ourselves? Because if we're looking to ourselves, just like an eight-year-old that tells his dad, I don't need your help. So the eight-year-old's trying to lift something he can't lift. The father can't come in and lift it up for him until the young boy says, Dad, I need your help. And that's all it takes. Okay. So (laughs) It's just like Jesus said to the guy. He said, wilt thou be made whole? Exactly right. Do you want to be made whole? What what do you want? How bad do you want it? Do you want to be made whole? And that's where the desire... Uh, is the tree of life. Yes. And so, all right, so make it as sure as you can. I've already tempted people with your daughter's miracle. So if you could, real quickly, just tell us God's goodness on that. Uh, sure. Well, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> people would have looked at me back in the day and said, you know, um, that Ken Chen's got it made. Beautiful wife, beautiful daughter, picture of health, everybody, and 
all the things that go with it. And in a moment of time, Tony, her world was turned upside down. She started having seizures. And so no matter how good life is in every other area, if your child begins to suffer like this, and as a father, you feel completely helpless, and there's nothing that I could do except watch. And, you know, we prayed and prayed and had people pray. And, you know, we sought out uh, medical help and the best doctors that you could find. I mean, we had a doctor from the Mayo Clinic, and we actually flew up to Cleveland, to the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, there's a world-renowned doctor there who's written all the textbooks on epilepsy and teaches other doctors about it, neurologists. Um you know, just searching. It was a 10-year search. Uh, it just didn't happen overnight. And, you know, uh, after a period of time on this, um, meds were changed. And, I mean, man, we went through it, ups and downs, highs and lows. Sometimes it was better than others. But, uh, you know, it, it, at the point, you know, we're about 10 years in. And, and when I came back from the Cleveland Clinic and saw this world-famous doctor, that, that's a miracle we even got in to see this particular doctor. I, it was just a crazy miracle. Uh, um, but uh, but when she did all she could do, and and I and my daughter got worse as a result of that. All, all the trouble we went to, all the effort, all the money. Like the lady in the Bible, you know, she spent her spent everything. She was none the better. But after a period of time, just the prayers began to rise up, and we began to notice a you know a change in her, and the seizures became less and less, and you know God's. Uh, slow healing process on that. You know, again, God didn't do it the way I wanted to. I mean, I wanted to snap my fingers and have this thing done, healed in a moment of time. But uh, during this period of time, after about 10 years, God manifested a healing to her. And uh, we were already making plans, my wife and I were, that she would live with us the rest of her life because she can't drive a car, obviously wasn't in shape to work. You know, she was fully functional outside that, smart. But just, you know, life is completely turned upside down when you're having seizures like that and having them many times during the day. And so, you know, it's such a beautiful thing to to see this and to witness this, uh, such joy again at God's miraculous touch on her life. Uh, you know, uh, here in Texas, you have to go six months without having a seizure to get a car. And, uh, you know, it was such a precious time. You know, we went to a dealership here and, um, uh, I let her pick out a car, and man, I had them do it up. I, I had a big red bow. It wasn't Christmas time, Tony, but I told them suckers, I said, man, this is not just an ordinary car we're getting here. God has done a supernatural work, and they had this beautiful, I mean, humongous red bow on top of that car, and they drove it around the corner, and she started crying, and I started crying, and <laughs> just celebrating the goodness of God, and she's uh, gone on now. Just wow. I mean, she just graduated. Uh, in uh, in May, from uh, one of the major universities in the nation, from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, audio visual production degree, mm. and the fact that I mean Nashville traffic. If anybody out there is driven in Nashville, yeah, uh, they drive. Know, <laughs> it, it, it'll, it'll keep you on your knees driving in that <laughs> traffic. You know, she uh, she spent a couple of years up there living on her own, on her own. Hey, Amen. When, when I'm thinking she's going to live with me the rest of her life on her own and passes with great grades and and driving in Nashville. Yeah, drive. Yeah, <laughs> that might not sound like a big deal to some people, but it's a supernatural. Huge. That, that is, is huge. a super supernatural miracle. Hey, Amen. I mean, that oh wow, yeah. And, a, and 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 just bring that home a little bit more. Most people when they suffer these type of strokes. It's considered pretty terrible just to be two and three minutes. Her strokes were the last up to 20 minutes, correct? Yeah. yeah. And so th this is what God brought her out of. Thank you, yeah. Jesus. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't let you go without you sharing those two miracles as well. Well, I sure do appreciate you coming on, pushing boundaries, giving your testimony, your daughter's testimony, and your mother's testimony. I know it will bless a lot of my listeners and viewers. And so mm -hmm. I just really appreciate uh, you coming on, spending your time with me. Do you have any uh, final words for us? Uh, can we just pray for them? Sure. Yes. 
Father, we thank you for this time that Tony and I have been together, God, and as this goes out into the world, God, God, you said your word would not return to you void. And so, God, we pray, God, that the Holy Spirit, the breath of God that breathed into Adam and that breathed into Tony and I, God, that that Holy Spirit would take this uh, time and this message of God and would breathe life into the listeners, God, that you would quicken their spirits and God, and that you would speak to their situation, whatever they're up against, God, and that they can overcome, they can receive from you, God, their healing, their deliverance, God, anything that they need, God, that they can touch the throne. So, Lord, we just glorify you. We thank you, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just give you praise, God, for these testimonies, God. We know we we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So God, just take these words, anoint them, bless them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 And thank you all for listening. Be yeah. blessed. Be yeah. healed. And be a blessing. Yes, hallelujah.